Hello, everyone. Happy to Hello, see Martin. you here. Hope you had a good week. So, the sutta tonight is rather interesting. It has to do with dependent origination and uh, the sensual pleasures, material form and feeling. And I found, I found it quite interesting as I was going through it. This is the Maha Dukkha Kanda Sutta, the greater discourse on the mass of suffering. One of the problems that I have with giving this short, short talks every week is I don't get to finish the sutta for you, so you have to finish it yourself. But if you have any questions about it, write the question down and next week we'll discuss what he was talking about, okay? So, thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. Then when it was morning, a number of monks dressed and taking their bowl and outer robes went into Sawati for alms. The outer robe is a double thick robe. So monks can use that as a blanket or uh, stay warmer with a double thick robe. Then they thought, it's still too early to wander for alms in Sawati. Suppose we went to the park of the wanderers of other sects. So they went to the park of the wanderers of other sects and, the, and they exchanged greetings with the wanderers. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down at one side and the wanderer said to them, friends, the recluse Gotama describes the full understanding of sensual pleasures. And we do so too. The recluse Gotama describes the full understanding of material form. And we do too. The recluse Gotama describes a full understanding of feeling, and we do so too. What then is the distinction here, friends? What is the variance? What is the difference between the recluse Gotama's teaching of the Dhamma and ours, between his instruction and ours? Do we have Kleenex? Then those monks neither approved or disproved the wanderer's words. Without doing either, they rose from their seats and went away thinking, we shall come to understand the meaning of these words in the Blessed One's presence. I'm sure they had some discussion or other but they didn't answer as completely as the, the Buddha could. When they'd wandered for alms in Sawati and returned from their alms round, after the meal, they went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and said, and told him what had taken place. The Blessed One, monks, Wanderers of other sects who speak thus should be questioned thus. But friend, what is the gratification? What is the danger? 
What is the escape in the case of sensual pleasures? What is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the escape in the case of material forms? What is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the escape in the case of feeling? Being questioned thus, wanderers of other sex will fail to account for the matter. And what is more, they will get into difficulties. Why is that? Because it's not their province. I see no one in the world with its gods and its maras, its brahmas in this generation with recluses and brahmins, with its princes and its people, who can satisfy the mind with a reply to these questions, except for the Tathagata or his disciples, or one who has learned, <coughs> learned it from them. <coughs> Now we're going to get into the section on sensual pleasures. And what, monks, is the gratification in the case of sensual pleasures? Monks, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Odors cognizable by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Flavors cognizable with the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are the gratification in the case of sensual pleasures. And what monks is the danger in the case of sensual pleasures? Here monks, on account of the craft by which a clansman makes a living, whether checking or accounting or calculating or farming or trading or husbandry or archery or royal service or whatever craft there it may be, he has to face cold. He has to face heat. He is injured by contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and creeping things. If you've ever lived in Asia, you know that there's a lot of creeping things. He risks death by hunger and thirst. Now this is a danger in which the case of sensual pleasures is a mass of suffering visible here and now, having sensual pleasures as its cause, sensual pleasures as its source, sensual pleasures as its basis, the cause simply being sensual pleasures. If no property comes to the clansman while he works, and strives and makes effort thus. He sorrows, grieves, and laments. He weeps, beating his breast, and becomes distraught and crying. My work is in vain. My effort is fruitless. 
Now, this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures. I think an awful lot of people experience this sort of thing, um, especially with the virus, the way it is forcing people to stay inside and they can't work. And they get depressed very easily. They don't know what to do with their mind. So there's a lot of sorrow because of sensual pleasures, because you can't get what you want when you want it. You can't do the things you want to do so that you can be prosperous. The cause of this kind of fruit, fruitlessness being simply sensual pleasures. That's part of the first noble truth, isn't it? Not getting what you want or getting what you don't want. Getting in debt. Always feeling bad and not being able to improve your lot in life. If property comes to the clansman while he works and strives and makes an effort thus, he experiences pain and grief in protecting it. How shall neither kings nor thieves come make off with my property? nor fire burn it, nor water sweep it away, nor hateful airs make off with it. And as he guards and protects his property, kings and thieves make off with it, or fire burns it, or water sweeps it away, or hateful airs make off with it. And he sorrows, grieves, and laments, he weeps, beating his breast, and becomes distraught. What if I have... What I had, I have no longer. Now this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures. The cause simply being sensual pleasures. Now what we do when somebody comes and takes our... our things away as we blame them and we don't see that our attachment to material things is the cause of the pain. Again, with sensual pleasures as the cause, sensual pleasures as the source, sensual pleasures as the basis, the cause simply being sensual pleasure. Kings quarrel with kings, nobles with nobles, Brahmins with Brahmins, householders with householders, mother quarrel with child, child with mother, father with child, child with father. Brothers quarrel with brother, Brothers with sister, sister with brothers, friend with friend, and here in their quarrels, their brawls, their disputes, they attack each other with fists, clod, sticks, or knives, whereby they incur death or deadly suffering. Now this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures the cause being simply sensual pleasures. Again, <coughs> excuse me, with sensual pleasures as the cause, men take swords and shields and buckle on bows and, and quivers, and they charge into battle massed in double array with arrows and spears flying and swords flashing. And here they are wounded by arrows and spears and their heads are cut off by swords whereby they incur death or deadly suffering. Now this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures. 
to cause simply being sensual pleasures. Again, with sensual pleasures as the cause, men take to swords and shields and buckle on bows and quivers, and they charge slippery, slippery bastions with bows and arrows flying and spears flying and swords flashing. There they are wounded by arrows. And spears and slashed with boiling liquids and crushed under heavy weights and their heads are cut off by swords whereby they incur death or deadly suffering. Now this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures. Again, with sensual pleasures as the cause, men break into houses, plunder wealth, commit burglary, ambush highways, seduce others' wives. And when they're caught, kings have many kinds of torture inflicted on them. The kings have them flayed with whips, beaten with canes, beaten with clubs. They have their hands cut off, their feet cut off, their hands and feet cut off, their ears cut off, their nose cut off, their ears and nose cut off. They have them sub subjected to a porridge pot. That means being boiled in oil. To a polished shell shave. That's taking off the skin with a uh, seashell. Uh, there's something that's called Rahu's mouth and it's fiery wreath and the flaming hand and the blades of grass. They have a kind of grass in Asia that's called Kusa grass and it is very, very sharp. It'll, it'll if, if you pull a uh, one strand of grass through your fingers, you'll come up with bloody fingers. So one of the things that I noticed in almost all of the holy books, if you want to find out anything about torturing someone else, you go to the holy books and they describe it very well for you. I'm not suggesting that you do it, of course. But I always found it very interesting. I mean, in, in the Bible, in the Koran, there's all kinds of different tortures that they describe. I often wondered why it got put into books that are supposed to be for healing, for getting along with other people. But you have to know what to do when they don't do that, when they're not healing, when they're fighting. <laughs> there's, there's other of these tortures that it goes through. I'm not going to go through these. It gets depressing listening to this stuff after a period of time. No, it, <laughs> David is in love with the hell realms. He reads all the books on the hell realms he can. So he wants to find out all of the tortures that can happen. So, <laughs> so he thinks it's kind of a good thing to be able to listen to this, but I'm not going to do that. 
again with the uh, sensual pleasures as the cause, sensual pleasures as the source, sensual pleasures as the basis, the cause simply being sensual pleasures. People indulge in misconduct of body, speech, and mind. Having done so on the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, even in hell. Now this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures, a mass of suffering in the life to come. Having sensual pleasures as its cause, sensual pleasures as its source, sensual pleasures as its basis, the cause simply being sensual pleasures. Now the thing with the meditation that's very interesting is when people, before they start meditating, they go through uh, every, everybody that I've run across, they're looking for a way out of the suffering. And then they run across meditation and the advertising for the meditation is, well, yeah, you become more happy and you don't, you let go of all these emotional ties and emotional upsets and that sort of thing. And you can sleep better and you do get better at your job and you actually have more fun in your life. Actually, there's an awful lot of people that get more into their suffering because of the meditation and they can, they actually suffer more if the meditation is not being done in the proper way. And the meditation that I teach, the TWIM, is the only meditation that I've seen that is very successful. Because it teaches you to have more balance in your mind. And the more equanimity you have in your mind, the easier everything in life becomes. So, I, I've run across many, many, many people that are more interested in studying what the suttas say than in following what the suttas suggest. When you come here to meditate, we take your books away, except for the books we want you to read. The books we want you to read are mostly instruction in how to be doing this. And it's real important for you to understand that there is a lot of misunderstanding of people when we talk about keeping the precepts and why do we want you to keep the precepts. The reason that we want you to keep the precepts, and it's your choice whether you do or not, but the we reason we want you to keep the precepts is so that it will lead to a more calm, balanced mind where there is a kind of mindfulness that you get from keeping the precepts. And that is, you know what you're going to do and what you're going to say before you say it or do it. And that gives you the opportunity to make a good choice for yourself. So the more clear you can become with keeping the precepts without breaking them, 
the less guilty feeling you will have. And that takes a big load off of your emotional states. And this leads to a form of letting go of the suffering, the third noble truth. Now, what's the cause of suffering? The cause of suffering is always craving. How do you recognize craving when it arises? It causes tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. It causes you to get into emotional upsets where you start arguing with somebody else and you talk over them while they're talking. That's really kind of a strange phenomena because while you're talking, you hear what you say, but you don't hear what somebody else says. And they're talking, they hear what they say, but they don't hear what you say. So it's a waste of effort to be talking or trying to convince somebody else of a point of view by talking over them. Quite often, this is the cause of a lot of these uh, problems these days. Because people haven't learned how to listen and carry on uh, a good conversation without praise and without blame. So anytime you get into a situation where you, you get uh, uh, emotional, the emotion arises because in the past you have broken precepts and you feel guilty. And you want to blame somebody else for your pain. But your pain is caused by you. You can't blame other people for your pain. So, <clears throat> and what, monks, is the escape in the case of sensual pleasures? It is the removal of desire and lust, the abandoning of desire and lust for sensual pleasures. This is the escape in the case of sensual pleasures. Now, isn't that what I was just talking about? You use the six R's in your daily activities, especially when you see that you're getting caught up in an emotional reaction. A reaction is an action that happens the same way, over and over again. Something close arises that always sets you off and gets you mad. That is a reaction. You're acting again like you always act. And this is part of your habitual tendency. When you keep the precepts for a period of time, you actually are starting to see how much pain you cause yourself by reacting. And you start backing away from that. Generally, the, the reaction, the anger, the fear, the anxiety, the disappointment, whatever it happens to be, is because of an expectation that you have and you need to let go of your expectations. You want people to act the way you want them to and when they don't act that way, well, it's their fault. 
Now you've heard me over the last little bit talking a lot about forgiveness. And what does forgiveness do? It helps let you to let go of your pain of reactions. And then you respond with a clear mind that's balanced, that doesn't insist that other people act the way that you act. You see what I'm saying? Please understand, this is important stuff. So the letting go of desire and lust for sensual pleasures, and it's sensual pleasures at any of the sense doors. It doesn't matter which sense door it is, it's still caused by want, desire. I want it to be the way I want it to be. When I want it that way. And you hear all of that craving that is in those statements. And what is the craving? I like it or I don't like it. I want it or I don't want it. I. It's taking it personally. And then it's not getting what you want when you want it. So there's a lot to the keeping of the precepts that lead to more and more balance in your mind. That those recluses and Brahmins who do not understand as it actually is the gratification as gratification, the danger as danger, and the escape as in the case of sensual desires, can either fully understand sensual pleasures or instruct another so that he can fully understand sensual pleasures. That is impossible. That those recluses and Brahmins who understand as it actually is, the gratification is gratification, the danger is danger, and the escape as escape in the cause of sensual pleasures can either themselves fully understand sensual pleasures or instruct another so that they can be fully they can fully understand sensual pleasures. That is possible. So what we're saying here is you have to experience it first for yourself before you can convince anybody else. And the way you convince other people about keeping the precepts is by keeping them for yourself and being the example. You know how little kids learn? They learn their behavior by watching their parents behave in different situations. If a parent gets angry and becomes violent, then the little kid learns that that's the way you handle anger. And it can cause all kinds of suffering and dissatisfaction and miscommunication because you're not being the example. You're not showing how you don't use curse words and you insist that they don't either. When I first came back to this country after being in Asia for 12 years, I was completely shocked at the foul language that's being used on television, on the radio, in the movies, and 
with people that are just talking in the normal everyday kind of speech. I was completely shocked. I, I kept on walking around thinking that people were being taught to be foul-mouthed. And a purpose, a person who uses a lot of bad language causes a lot of upset in other people. And it causes other people to, to have more and more dislike and dissatisfaction happening to them. And they verbalize it. So, and what monks is the gratification in the case of material form? Suppose there were a girl of a noble class or a Brahmin class or a householder stock in her 15th or 16th year, neither too tall nor too short, neither too thin nor too fat, neither too dark nor too fair, is her beauty and loveliness then at its height? Yes, venerable sir. Now the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on that beauty and loveliness are the gratification in the case of material form. And what, monks, is the danger in the case of material form? Later on, one might see that same woman here 80 or 90 or 100 years old and see her as crooked as a roof bracket, doubled up, supported by walking sticks, tottering, frail, youth gone, teeth broken, gray-haired, scantily-haired, bald, wrinkled, with limbs all blotchy. What do you think, monks? Has her former beauty and loveliness vanished and the danger become evident? Yes, venerable sir. This is the danger in the case of material form, aging. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, I didn't have black feet skin, but I'm starting to develop it now. That's one of the dangers of material form. It, it ages, it gets old. <coughs> Again, one might see that same woman afflicted, suffering and gravely ill lying fouled in their own excrements and their urine, lifted up by some or set down by others. What do you think? Has her former beauty and loveliness vanished and the danger become evident? Yes, venerable sir. This too is a danger in the case of material form. Again, one might see that same woman as a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, one, two, or three days dead, bloated, living, livid, oozing matter. What do you think, monks? Has her former beauty and loveliness vanished and the danger become evident? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, this too is a danger in the case of material form. There's a story about this very expensive courtesan. And she would charge a thousand dollars for a night to, for, to spend a night with her. She was very well formed, well, uh, 
the famous for her singing ability, for her dancing ability, for her charms in other ways. And then she died. Now in India, they generally don't keep a body around very long because it starts to smell because of the heat and the humidity and that sort of thing. And the Buddha, after she had died, the Buddha had her out so people could see that body and how it started to decay. And after the third day, three days after her death, the Buddha called all the villagers together and they said, who will give me a thousand pieces of gold to spend a night with this person, this courtesan? Of course, nobody's going to do anything like that. Then the Buddha said, who will give me 500 pieces of gold? No takers. Who will give me 100 pieces of gold? no takers. Who will give me 50 pieces of gold? No takers. Who will give me one piece of gold, one coin, to spend the night with this courtesan? <coughs> and the point being that bodies do get old and they decay and it's not us. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. So <clears throat> it's real important, especially if you go to a funeral of a friend, to spend time looking at that friend, reflecting on what they were like when they were alive. And also, it helps you to let go of your grief because they are gone. Quite often, people ask me how to, how to overcome grief. Uh, a friend or relative that is gone, and they were much loved. And I tell them to get a good picture of them and sit down every day for a period of time and tell them and remember the times when they did good things, when they had laughs together, when they helped each other. And talk to the picture, talk to that person after a short period of time, the grief starts to let up. An awful lot of people get caught in the grief and they hold that grief for even years. And they hold that sadness for, for years because they don't like the idea that material form changes, bodies change, and it's not near as beautiful or as much fun as it used to be. So when you sit and you talk to a picture of that person, you're, you're going back into your memories and you remember how they were kind and how they were helpful and how you had fun being with them. The pain of the grief starts to dissipate. And before long, you'll be able to let go of the pain of separation because that's what it actually is. But still remember the good things that you did together, how you were happy together. And this helps a lot 
to let go of that suffering, let go of that pain. Now there can be some memories that pop up when you're talking with them about things that they did that wasn't so nice. So forgive them for not understanding. Let go of the pain of that past experience. You'll feel a lot more uplifted and happy when you're able to do that. And what, monks, is the gratification in the, in the case of feelings? Here, monks, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. On such an occasion, he does not choose for his own affliction or for the affliction of another or for the affliction of both. On that occasion, he feels a feeling that is free from affliction, free from pain. Why? Because you have developed a mind that is uplifted. While you are in the jhana, you will experience joy, you will experience tranquility, you will experience a peaceful, calm mind. And it's quite comfortable. <clears throat> the highest gratification in the case of feelings is freedom from afflicting, I say. Again, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. And in each jhana, you are experiencing a pure mind. You're experiencing a mind that doesn't have any craving in it. And if there's no craving in your mind, how can there be afflictions? How can there be pain and suffering? <clears throat> and it keeps going on through the third jhana and the fourth jhana. The highest gratification in the case of feelings is freedom from affliction, freedom from hindrances. When you are in a jhana, you don't have any hindrances. You don't have anything that you're holding on to that's unwholesome. And this leads more and more to a mind that is developed equanimity. And eventually you'll get to a place where you start getting into disenchantment which means letting go of the fascination of things with attachment to them. And this includes foods and all kinds of different sensual pleasures. <coughs> and what, monks, is the danger in the case of feeling? Feelings are impermanent. Feelings are suffering and subject to change. This is the danger in the case of feelings. Now, the way that I teach, you can be in a jhana while you're doing your daily activities. You do have to use the six R's. You do have to keep your mindfulness strong and remembering to smile in your mind. Not necessarily a big smile on your lips, 
I was with my teacher, Usil Ananda, for a number of years. And I know, I've known him since the 80s. When he died, the uh, funeral home didn't have a picture of him. And he always had a little grin on his face, always. And people used to look at him and they'd say, oh, you have such a young face. Your face is very beautiful because you have this smile. At the funeral home, they didn't put the smile on his face and I hardly recognized him as my teacher. I mean, it was really remarkable. I didn't know that this was intentional. His smile was intentional all the time. And that says that his mindfulness was exceptional to keep that smile going no matter what. And because of that, his mindfulness became more and more clear about what he was going to do before he did it. And he would make the choice of choosing the wholesome path. So <clears throat> with your daily activities, put a little smile on your face, just a little one. It doesn't have to be a big one. But the mindfulness you get from keeping that smile on your face will improve your mindfulness and awareness of what you're going to be doing before you do it which means that you're going to have more and more a tendency to keep the precepts without breaking them. And that helps remind you. Your mindfulness is remembering to observe how your mind's attention moves from one thing to another. You can use the six R's and you can let go. The more you smile, smile with your eyes as much as you can. Smile, little tiny smile, little Buddha smile on your lips. And that dictates what happens in your mind. Your mind will tend towards the wholesome, the uplifting, the happy. And that makes you want to help other people to be happy and help other people to by example allow other people to let go of their suffering too because you are being the example and monks is the escape in the case of feeling. What is the escape in the case of feeling? It is the removal of desire and lust. Oh, the relaxed step, the relaxing and smiling and staying with the smiling as your object of meditation. The abandonment of desire and lust for feeling this is emotional feeling as well as physical feeling. This is the escape in the case of feeling. That those monks, those recluses and Brahmins who do not understand as it ac actually is the gratification as gratification, the danger as danger and the escape as escape in the case of feelings can either themselves fully understand 
or instruct another so that they can fully understand feeling. If they don't do it and practice it themselves, they don't understand. This is why when so many people want to just, well, I would rather study the suttas than do the practice. They're missing out a lot. They're hurting themselves a lot because it takes a combination of both. You can misinform and you can not change yourself and you can misrepresent the Buddha's teaching if you don't practice it. And I'm not saying all scholars are the same and I'm not saying they all don't understand as clearly as they could. But it takes a combination of both to truly be able to give the information to other people. And again, you give the information to other people by your example, by your helpfulness to other people, by your kindness to other people, by your words that you speak to other people. that those monks and recluses who understand as it actually is, the gratification is gratification, the danger is danger and the escape as escape in the case of feeling, can either themselves fully understand feeling and instruct another so that they can fully understand feeling, that's possible. There's not going to be any hesitation in, in your helping other people to relax, helping other people to open up and help relieve suffering from themselves and other people. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. <clears throat> so, one of the reasons that I became a Buddhist, and for a long time, even as, as I was a monk, I never claimed that I was a Buddhist, now I do. is because of the self-responsibility you have to have. You can't give your happiness to other people unless you have happiness in yourself. You can't give away something that you don't directly know and understand. So the more you can keep your practice going, with sitting, but especially with your daily life. I know an awful lot of people that are IT people, and they tell me that they have to be serious. Why? Why can't you smile while you're working? Why can't you keep your mind uplifted and not get frustrated at this machine because it doesn't do things the way you want it to when you want it done. Why not? You can be happy or you can be unhappy. It's your choice. You can laugh, you can cry. I prefer laughing to crying. It makes my body feel good. So, please uplift your mind, understand about the, the sense doors, 
understand about material existence and don't get so caught up in your perspective. Keep your mind uplifted. Smile more. Like my teacher. He was amazing. I mean, I was with him for for uh, two years, pretty constant all the time. I never saw him without that little grin that he had on his face. And I was one of the pallbearers for him after he had died and gone to the funeral home. And seeing him without that little grin changed his face completely. And I wanted to tell him to take, take the body back and put that grin on his face. That was, that was him. But I couldn't do that. They wouldn't allow. Okay. So, <clears throat> please keep your practice going as much as possible. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Bansai, for your talk. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I think I understand what you mean by, you know, we expect others to behave the way we want them to, and then when they don't, we make ourselves suffer. Right. So it seems like I have to learn how to navigate the world full of co-workers who don't do what they're supposed to do, children who don't listen when they're supposed to, right? It's like nothing in the world is going according to the way I want it to go. And I understand that's my suffering, right? But <clears throat> like, how do we navigate when nothing out there is really meant to go the way we want it to go? Um, you know, like how drop, drop your perspective and demands that they be that way. You know, I've, I've been with a lot of different kinds of monks. I've been with uh, Mahayana monks. I've been with the Tibetan monks. And when we get into conversation, we don't have arguments. We can say, well, this is... You're, what you're saying right here is different than what I'm, I'm learning. I'm not judging whether it's right or wrong. I'm just stating a fact. And when I start talking to them about smiling and uh, using right effort, we never disagree which is really kind of an amazing thing. I've seen monks get together and they, they start getting very angry with each other. The Zen monks and the Tibetan monks, they don't even want to eat in this, at the same table. They have their perspective is so different and their development of that unwholesome mind of judging and condemning. See, that's the thing that we have to develop so that we don't have so many problems with that. And as we lose that demands and likes and dislikes and that sort of thing, we become an example of having a balanced mind. Other people catch on to that. So you have to change your perspective so that it's a little bit more accepting and start looking with gratitude at the different things that they're doing. Okay, this, this is a really important because when you start looking with gratitude, that sets up a feeling around you of acceptance. And when that acceptance is there, your mind is very uplifted. Your mind is very happy and willing to 
listen to what other people are saying without judging. And when you start losing that judgment, they stop being so disagreeable. Okay, it's what we project out to the world. When we project an accepting mind, then people become more agreeable. Very seldom do I run across someone that, that is hateful when I'm in an agreeable, accepting, non judgmental state. So we affect the world around us. And that's why I say giving, being the example for other people, it changes them as well as it changes yourself. Okay? Thank you. Okay. I have a question from somebody in the chat. Okay. If you were able to have every sensual pleasure, would craving for that sensual pleasure still be the cause of suffering? If we were able to make samsara the way we want it to be, <laughs> would nibbana still be worth attaining? <laughs> well, you have all the five sense doors, right? or six sense doors because you have mind in there too. <clears throat> what is your perspective of what, which sense door arises and whether I like it or I don't like it, whether I, my mind feels tight around it or you're relaxed and accepting of it. See, anything we make a big deal of in our mind, there is attachment there. There is craving there. There is the identification of this is me, this is mine. And it leads to, oh, this piece of cake is really good. Maybe I'll have another. But when you start developing a little bit more, what happens is you start to get disenchanted and that craving mind becomes less and less so you don't take that second piece because it tastes so good with as a first piece it doesn't mean you can't enjoy say a piece of um, cheesecake you can enjoy the cheesecake while you're eating it, but after it's gone, when you have good equanimity, you don't think about it anymore. There's no more craving for more of it. I want more because that was really good. It doesn't come up in your mind. Your mind stays more and more peaceful and calm. Now, uh, I, I don't know about the sansara and nibbana. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> the reason that you the reason that you are here is because you have broken a lot of precepts in the past, and you've identified with them, and you're caught. On the, on the wheel of sansara. Nibbana is letting go of that. Letting go of the judgments, the opinions, the unwholesome nature of things and developing a wholesome nature of things. That's what Nibbana actually is. So I'll let you decide for yourself with what you do with that. Anybody else? Uh, hi, Bhante. Hi. Hi. I have two How questions. Going? 
Yeah, it's yeah, going I'm well. Okay. <laughs> okay. One day I have two questions. First question is uh, regarding the same sutta. Uh, I came across this sentence when they are mentioning about quarreling. Nobles with nobles. I got shocked by seeing that. What is mean by quarreling between nobles and no nobles to nobles? Well, uh, we don't really have much in the way of nobles in uh, in society like it used to, but the nobles were the ruling class. Uh, yeah, I can and go to the main. Yeah. Go in, to my neighbor. In Next. India, they still have the... Uh, different class levels, the the Brahmins and the warrior class and that sort of thing. And that would just mean that they're quarreling among the, let's say, the Brahmins. And the quarreling about among the, uh, the warrior class, they're the ones that, that have more action. There was a lot of different sections that was ruled by the warrior class during the time of the Buddha. And they, they didn't, they weren't so influenced by the Brahmins. The Brahmins were more or less the scholars, although they did get in arguments all the time. Just, just like these days okay uh i can go to my next it is not a question next okay. one uh one day i see that uh, in asia we have very few teachers we have just a couple of teachers in asia uh, but in us we have a lot of teachers can you please plan more teachers in asia <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I first started taking of uh, Sayadaw Lucila Nanda, that was in 1980, he told me that I was going to be a teacher and that I should let Dhamma grow by itself. You have to set a good foundation, which means keeping the precepts very well. And if something grows too fast, it goes away real fast. And, and you can see that with somebody like uh, Rajneesh. He became super, super popular really fast. And now you hardly hear of anything that he taught. So let it grow on its own. One, one of the statements that I very much like is when you take care of Dhamma, Dhamma takes care of you. And what that basically means is you will grow at the speed that is good for you. There are some decent teachers around there are some good teachers around in India, but there, India has so many people in it and so many different opinions and ideas, it's hard to run across them sometime. But Sister Kema in uh, uh, where, where is she Mumbai. now? Mumbai. Mumbai. She's, she's starting to become more and more popular and teaching other people how to be teachers. So get in touch with her. I don't know how to tell you how to do that. You'd have to tell David and he can help you with getting her email and that sort of thing. I do attend some of her uh, talks. 
Good. I know that she has two classes a week on uh, on this kind of this program, a Zoom. So get in touch with her and she'll help you as much as she can. But just like the sutta was saying, as you get older, you just start hobbling around instead of walking like normal and that sort of thing. It does happen. <laughs> Anyway, do you have any other question? Uh, that's Salpanthi. I don't have any other question. Okay. Thank you for this talk, Pante. Thank you. How is your uh, practice going? It's going well. Uh, I'm sitting around one and a half hour every day. Every day. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Turn that into a habit. Sure, Bhante. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I have a question, Bhante. Okay. Thank you for your talk. And um, I have, uh, my question is about uh, the fourth of the Brahma Viharas, equanimity. Um, I'm, usually it's translated, well, the, what the, um, Upeka is usually translated as equanimity. Um, but I've, I'm kind of getting the feeling that it, it's, it may be a little more than that. Kind of, it's the balance of mind born in understanding the equality of everything and every, um, all the beings, like the, the fact that we are all made up of the same stuff right. and have all the same suffering. Is, is this, do you think that is the right notion in this word, in this translation? Well, I, I, I generally try to say balance of mind when it comes to equanimity, because that's what it really is. Your mind stays in a sense of balance, not getting knocked off balance by emotional um, attachments. And it starts making your perspective more accepting of what is happening in the present. So you won't have near as many arguments or disagreements. You'll listen and discuss more often than having that emotional uh, dissatisfaction arise with whatever the whatever problem there is. So I I use the word balance a lot, and it seems to work all the way through, even through neither perception nor non-perception. Because when you have strong balance, then you can see slight movements in that balance, which is the start of some kind of disturbance. And you can relax and let it go right then without getting distracted. Okay. Okay, Bhante, thank you. So kind of keeping it, keeping it simple and practical, better yeah. than thinking too much about it. Thank you. Yeah, thinking too much is, a, is that's a Western disease, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there's an interesting thing between people thinking too much and just observing. And you, you do have to use some words to describe what you're seeing. And that doesn't mean that it's a, a distraction. It's just, it happens one time, like 
you can be sitting and all of a sudden your mind feels very strong, peaceful, and calm. And your mind, your, your mind will say, oh, this is really peaceful and calm. And then that's it. There's no more thinking about it or analyzing, where did that come from? Why did that happen? You don't have that. You just have simple observation thoughts. And they're, they're not unwholesome, they're just there. They're just description. Okay? Anybody else have a question? Okay, then let's share some merit. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So you all have a good weekend and a good week. And I hopefully will see you again next Sunday. Thank you, Bante. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you, David.